Hey everybody, we have just a few more days before our AP exam, uh, but guess what? I am stuck with jury duty. So here we are reviewing by means of a YouTube video. So here we have unit three. Uh, unit three is over all the structures of the nervous system. And then at the very end, we'll get into genetics for just a little bit. Okay, here we go. So on this slide, you see uh, several terms. And at this point in the course, hopefully you know all these terms pretty well. All right. So dendrites, these are these structures on the outside of a neuron. They are there to pick up stimuli, such as neurotransmitters. Okay. And when they are touched, they are activated by means of sodium potassium pumps that we'll get into in just a few slides. And once there's this activation, there is an electrical current or impulse or action potential. See, I'm using a lot of terms here, right? There is this electrical impulse that is generated. It goes through the cell body, also called a soma. It goes all the way through the axon. Uh, and if you recall, the axon is coated with the myelin or myelin sheath, which is made out of fat. And fat, of course, is a great conductor of electricity. If you're lacking the myelin, you might be at risk for something like, say, multiple sclerosis. Uh, but I digress. Finally, when this electrical current gets to the very end of the axon, you have the axon terminal. And then it has to go across the axon terminal, but now things change up a little bit. Electricity cannot cross the axon terminal. Instead, uh, neurotransmitters, these chemicals go across. Chemicals such as acetylcholine, dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, right? Or, or dopamine, that could go on and on perhaps, right? And finally, what you have are, are the terms, the presynaptic axon terminal, and then the synapse, of course. And then finally, you have the postsynaptic dendrite. And once that dendrite is activated by the, the subsequent neurotransmitter, uh, the electrical impulse starts all over again. Okay, bunch of stuff on this slide that I could read through, but I'm gonna be really quick here. Um, when a neuron is at rest okay we have negative 70 millivolts you have to know that voltage okay but then when it's activated right just like i said a moment ago when there's an electrical impulse going across then the voltage is positive 30 millivolts okay uh there is also something you need, you need to know called the all or none response so think of your neurons kind of like little light switches the light switch is either on or off, right? And it's the same thing with your neurons. So for example, if I stick my hand out, uh, I don't sort of feel germs or sort of feel air blowing on my hand. I either feel it or not, all or none. And then we get to these, the brain and just to kind of tie that in with what we've been covering, on the right, you see a figure of the, the brain. The outside of the brain is typically called gray matter. It's kind of grayish, kind of pinkish and that is made up of the dendrites and the somas. But you get into the interior of the brain, it's the white matter, and that is the, uh, the myelin, which is, of course, surrounding the axons. Now on the left, you see the uh, spinal cord, and it's the exact opposite, okay? So I just wanna remind you one more time, myelin, which is fat, is white colored. Okay, I told you we'd come back to the sodium potassium pumps, so here we go. In an AP bio course, there's a ton more to it, uh, but for the sake of this class, you need to know the order, and it's pretty straightforward. The order is sodium and potassium, right? And then you have to know the numbers, the three and the two. And of course, you have to know that this is an active process, hence it requires energy or ATP. Now, getting back to the numbers three and then two, my, my really silly hint here was just think of Spurs great Sean Elliott, who was number, 32, okay? I think we can skip through that. Once again, you see terms that are hopefully sounding very familiar here. Resting membrane potential is negative 70. Uh, an action potential, that, that's that impulse we spoke of earlier, that's positive 30, okay? And then on the left, nerve A, that is in reality the presynaptic axon terminal. Nerve B is the postsynaptic 
uh, dendrite. And all those dots are the neurotransmitters, the chemicals. And since it's an antidepressant, uh, specifically that would be serotonin. And that space, obviously, again, is the uh, synapse. Okay, agonists are, are chemicals, right? Could be drugs, for example, that mimic the effectiveness, the efficiency of the neurotransmitter. Or they might even be replicating the neurotransmitter to make this synaptic reaction so much faster. Whereas antagonists are blocking them, uh, kind of like, uh, like, like I put on the bottom, they're blocking a coin slot in a soda machine. Okay, so my little hint here, and I know I've said this several times in class, think of caffeine. Caffeine is a stimulant. That's how you would you know, categorize it as a drug. It's a stimulant, but at the same time, it's also an antagonist. So it stimulates you by blocking your sleepy time <laughs> neurotransmitters, okay? So I think that's enough said on that. Let's move on. Um, let's see, an uh, agonist, an antagonist again. Uh, something you're going to have to know on this test would be naloxone. That's another example. Uh, it's used to block opioids, right? Like like heroin, for example. That's another example you'll probably see on that test. It, it pops up on a lot of college psychology tests for whatever reason, okay? Like I said, caffeine, even though it's a stimulant, it is an antagonist. Now we get into the actual structures of the brain. So what we just finished would be all the neuron stuff, okay? Alrighty. So sensory neurons are obviously going to the brain. You touch something, you smell something, that has to go to the brain in order for you to integrate it, to make sense of it. So sensory neurons are afferent, okay? Like et, going to the brain. Motor neurons are going away from the brain, hence the your efferent, e for exit, okay? So suppose I stick my hand in an ant pile, right? So the ants are stinging away, it starts to hurt. There are impulses going to my brain, they are sensory. And then I decide after I thought about it, I wanna move my hand, right? Those are motor neurons or efferent neurons. And that all comes together when you look at the figure on the right. We're gonna break down that nervous system. We have the central nervous system, the CNS, of course the brain and the spinal cord. However, there's also the peripheral nervous system all the external nerves in the periphery, right, leading to the spinal cord, or in some cases the brain, uh, and that's breaking down, broken down further into the somatic and autonomic nervous system. For the somatic nervous system, here's my hint. It starts with the letter S, okay? S, so like sensory neurons, they're in my skin, okay? Like I said a moment ago, I, I, I stick my hand in an ant pile, okay? So those sensory neurons are part of the somatic nervous system. But then I wanna move my hand because the ants are, are causing pain, right? So then S also pertains to, of course, skeletal muscle, right? And then autonomic, uh, it kinda sounds like, hint, hint, automatic. So that would be my breathing, my heart rate, things of that nature. And, and then of course, the autonomic nervous system, the anus gets uh, broken down even further into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic is what uh, we always were taught. That's the fight or flight nervous system, whereas the parasympathetic is the resting and digesting. So with your fight or flight, you have these responses like your pupils dilate, your heart rate increases, things of that nature. And, and once again, my hint for this is none other than the letter S, like you are scared. S for scared, S for sympathetic. Uh, and then you look at a couple of neurotransmitters. This pops up a couple of times throughout the course. Uh, acetylcholine is linked with Alzheimer's, A and A. There's your hint as well. And dopamine is linked with Parkinson's. Hopefully you guys remember talking about Michael J. Fox earlier in the course. That, of course, was uh, uh, one of our examples. All right, finished covering the sympathetic nervous system or, or fight or flight. And again, remember that hint, S for scared, S for sympathetic. Okay, hormones and the endocrine system, we'll come back to this in more detail with the next slide. Here we go. So, if this was a biology class or an anatomy class, something along those lines, this list might be a lot, a lot longer, okay? 
uh, but for the sake of this class, you have to know the sex hormones. So with the ladies, that's estrogen and progesterone. Uh, for the guys, it's testosterone. And then along the way, you'll hear terms like oxytocin. That's the bonding hormone or the nursing hormone, those types of things. You've heard of that already, I think. Uh, the stress hormones, that's plural. So here you would have cortisol. Cortisol is important. We've talked a lot about that uh, over the semester. It has a role in sleep, a role with obesity even. And the other stress hormone is adrenaline. But hold on, for the sake of this class, we don't call it adrenaline. It's called epinephrine. And when it's a neurotransmitter in the brain, then it's called norepinephrine, all right? Then you have your master glands, which are the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Uh, so words like ghrelin, which is from a future lesson, hopefully that still rings a bell, your, your hunger uh, hormone, okay? And then you have the pineal gland. And again, at this, at this point, you gotta remember melatonin, your nighttime sleepy hormone, all right? Long-term memories. So the hippocampus, that's where long-term memories go to hang out. So if I said, what's the capital of Texas, you would say Austin. Uh, or the first time you scored a goal, your first home run, whether it's a semantic or, or episodic memory, right? Those are still all found deep within the hippocampus. Now you have this cerebellum, and that's in charge of your procedural memories. So when you were younger, you probably used the word muscle memories, but big kids call these procedural <laughs> memories. I'm such a dork. You know, like... Uh, riding a bicycle or throwing a ball, those types of things, okay? And finally, the structures, your, your lobes, which are all, all making up that wonderful, beautiful cerebral cortex, your frontal parietals, two parietals, one on each side, your temporals, two of those, of course, and then in the back of your head for vision, the occipital lobe, and then you have that old brain, the amygdala, okay? Uh, part of the limbic system, and I mentioned the hippocampus a moment ago, as well as the hypothalamus. Okay, that's kind of funny. See, the amygdala has that role with emotion. See? And uh, this this pops up on a million different tests. What is a heuristic, that rule of thumb, that mental shortcut? Next up, we have the brain stem. And I'll start bottoms up, okay? Uh, the medulla, or if you like the movie Waterboy, perhaps you call it the medulla oblongata. Uh, this is the transition really from the brain into the spinal cord. So it's closest to the, you know, your heart. So look at my hint there. It's in charge of the heart and the heart, respiration, things of that nature. Then you move up a little way and the pons has a role with sleep. So just look at my stupid hint there, pons with a bunch of Zs. And then finally the midbrain, smack dab in the middle of the brainstem. It's closest to the ears. So you see it has a role with your uh, hearing and things of that nature. In fact, you have your colliculi there. So if someone said, hey, and you like flinch, right? That is the midbrain that is responsible for that. Imaging, almost done with this stuff, imaging. The EEG, like when they do brain studies or sleep studies rather, uh, that's technically not imaging. That's for a future lesson, in fact. Uh, PET uses these tracers, it's kind of like a dye and it goes to your body and at certain times they can take an image of that based on where the dye is at and get an image, okay? Uh, and MRI, and of course, followed up with functional MRIs or fMRIs. Uh, this is more like a panoramic. It's a series of, of photographs so they can give you almost like this 3D interpretation of, of the structures and ultimately the functions of the brain. And when you see where it says functions, like you can actually see where parts of the brain are fired up uh, in terms of color based on how you think and what's being processed. And then finally you see a CT. Sometimes people call it a CAT scan. Uh, this is a little bit more like an X-ray. Uh, it's just a single picture. Like I said, an MRI is more like a panoramic. A CAT scan is just a short one-time picture kind of thing, okay? Uh, but what's unique where a CAT scan is more effective than an X-ray is that it can detect uh, damages going on within soft tissues, which could of course include the brain or maybe for more into sports, like a ligament or, or a tendon, something along those lines. Okay, what you see here is actually a lot of fun to talk about, okay? The left brain and the right brain. Now, not always, not 100% of the time for sure, not always again, but guys, males tend to be a little bit more left brain. 
whereas females, again, not always, not to generalize or what have you, but females tend to be a little bit more on the right-brained uh, side of the coin, okay? So, for example, when you look at left brain, you start seeing a lot of L's, like logic, linear thinking, language, okay? So let me explain what I mean by linear. If my wife gives me a list to go to the grocery store and go shopping, I am literally going directly down that list one item at a time. Whereas if my wife had the same list, she might recognize, probably better than I would, that you don't have to go in order if something is closer, like it's in the next aisle or what have you, okay? So there you start to see some of the differences between left and right brain. Uh, Right-brained individuals tend to be a little bit more on the artistic side. Uh, so the second letter of art is R. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more creative. They daydream. Uh, a little bit more musically, you know, inclined, that kind of thing, okay? And way back when, I showed you all a video, and it's pretty interesting, and it was of these monkeys. I hope you remember this. And the male monkeys were picking up trucks and playing with trucks, right? And the female monkeys are picking up the dolls. Like, there's no teaching here. They just intuitively uh, pick up the, the, you know, for the most part, the the trucks for the males and the dolls for the females. Kind of getting into how the, the hardwiring of the brain is a little bit different. Not always, but a little bit based on, on gender, okay? Okay, for neuroplasticity, hopefully you recall the younger you are. When you're in that quote-unquote critical period, you're making more connections, more synapses, right? That's why small children can recover from brain injuries or brain surgeries even uh, quicker than adults. That's also why small children learn foreign languages e easier than an adult can learn a foreign language or even an instrument uh, for that matter. And what enables this connectivity to take place? Something called the corpus callosum. That is this bridge, if you will, that connects the two hemispheres. Important figures that you should know, Broca and Warnicke. Uh, Broca is what enables us to get language out. Like right now I am speaking. Hello, Broca. B kind of sounds like producing. I am producing speech, the physical act of speech. Now, if I asked you what is 2 plus 2 in your mind, you are thinking 4. So when you're thinking 4, you are understanding the speech, and that's Warnicke. So understanding starts with you, you know, W, there's the, the word U is in W, so that's how you would remember Broca and Warnicke, all right? And, okay, that's kind of funny. The guy on the right is just saying a bunch of silliness, okay? And if he can talk, uh, but he doesn't know what he's talking about, that would be Warnicke, because he has no problem with producing the words. That's the Broca part that produces the words, okay? And there you have hints, output, input, if that helps as well. Phineas Gage, the guy that came back from a traumatic brain injury, but of course his personality changed. So that really lets us know conclusively, at least even way back then, uh, that the parts of the brain each had specific roles. Okay, split brain. This is something that you talk about a lot with epileptic patients. Uh, so remember earlier I said the left brain has a role in language. And you also have something called a crossover. So you see the word heart, right? And you look on the right of the dot, you see three letters, A-R-T, which spells art. So if you ask somebody with a split brain or who had gone through a split brain procedure, what word do they see? What will they say? Art. It's pretty fascinating, isn't it? And finally, last but not least, genetics. 23 pairs of chromosomes. 46 in all. If you have an extra chromosome or you're missing a chromosome, such as the case with Down syndrome, uh, you would call that a non-disjunction. A phenotype is the gene that's expressed, typically how you look. A genotype is both sets of genes or alleles, if you will. Uh, Mendel, Gregor Mendel was the uh, Austrian monk responsible for teaching us, at least early on, about heredity. And we have mutations. Some mutations are good. That leads to natural selection and evolution ultimately. Uh, some cause disorders, right? And then we have the whole idea of nature versus nurture. And of course, 
who do we study a lot? What what name kind of pops up? Of course, that would be identical twins, like especially identical twins separated at birth. Then you start to see if they're, uh, you know, the things they have in common are their nature, their biology, their genes, or their nurture. And a lot of times there are remarkable similarities of twins that were separated at birth. You know, they, they drive the same car. They both marry women that have blonde hair. They, they both play the same sports. They both have the same job. They both name their kids Timmy. They both eat enchiladas on Thursdays. They have a lot of the weird oddball similarities, and that's all true. Uh, but again, like I've always said, it's not nature versus nurture. It probably should be nature and nurture. You got to nurture the nature sometimes, you know. As I've always joked, I'm five foot ten, guys. I love basketball, but I probably couldn't make it as a pro because of my height, you know. You can't just teach me to be a power forward or center in the NBA. It doesn't work that way. It's nature and nurture. And then you have epigenetics. These are genes that are turned on uh, later on in life. And again, it comes back to uh, identical twins that get studied a lot for epigenetics as well. Again, for example, I might have two identical twins, right? But maybe one, as he lived his life, he was exposed to more stress. So he might have premature graying before the other twin. Or maybe he was exposed to some kind of toxin. He might develop cancer, but the other twin does not have that cancer. So that would be epigenetics, okay? Now, like I put on the last <laughs> bullet there, there's a lot in this unit, you know? Please take this serious. Please, I hope you watch over this video with an open mind and you're ready to learn because, uh, you know, we still got a ways to go, guys, all right? I think that's about it. God bless you. Miss you. See you soon. Bye.